Tina is doing our book recommendations first, though. Tina. Hello. Um, are you you don't have any books in the background, so I, I didn't know you read. Because most. Oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> you're supposed to you're supposed to have them on shelves and loads of ostentatious like I read sort of things. You know all those. My books. office here in the kitchen. Sorry. <laughs> So, so you put your, your shelves are they elsewhere? They're elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. No so what have, you got, what have you got on your on your shelves that you've taken off? Uh, what I are these then? Um, as former chair of Labour Against the Witch Hunt, I've got an affinity to witches. This is really good. I think this is the wrong way around, isn't it? It's called Caliban and the Witch uh, by Silvia Federici, and this is uh, by our Jackie Walker, Pilgrim State. Right. Um, I'm going to start with this one. Um, okay which is very interesting because um, if, if you if you talk about witch hunts, et cetera, if you think about it, I think lots of people just think, oh, that was a really dark, dark times, irrationality. Maybe there was hatred against women and there was there's no, no rationality to the witch hunt, which is sort of nicely summed up in some of the, the tests that they use to, to test witches, isn't it? Sort of you uh, you drown, you're innocent and you live, you're a witch and you're going to kill you anyway. Um, so there wasn't, you know, was this just hatred against against women, as some people think, you know, women being funny or menopausal, etc. And you have to you have to uh, get rid of them. Um, no, uh, it was not. It was also not just hate by men against women. It was actually a very rational campaign. And she explains this really, really well, which is it's fascinating. Will so you be able to put the link in the chat? Sure. After? Yeah. Okay. I, I will. I will write it afterwards. I'm, I'm a bit busy at the moment, but I'll oh no, you're talking. But someone's <laughs> saying, "Where's the link?" No, I'm just just saying yeah, there's, there's no link, but it's called Caliban and the Witch, Silvia Federici. Um, so if, you, if it turns out, if you look beyond, beneath the surface, the, the witch hunts were very, very rational and played a hugely important role in the transition from feudalism to capitalism. Um, it's a bit like, you know, if you look at the anti-Semitism smear campaign, and I'll get to that with Jackie Walker, um, over the last, last seven years, uh, it's not as irrational as it appears. You look at some of the comments by Ken Livingston, Mark Wadsworth, Jackie Walker, and you think, that's really not anti-Semitic, clearly. Uh, that's, you know, it's quite obvious. But the rationality behind it was uh, that it was about stopping all criticism of Israel and destroying Corbyn and a movement. And in that last aspect, the witch hunt in the Labour Party succeeded, as did the witch hunts in the so-called Middle Ages. Um, they succeeded with destroying anti-feudalist resistance movements, if we can call them that. So Silvia Federici, is a, she's a feminist and she's a Marxist, but quite a critical one, which is always a good thing, I think. Uh, I don't agree with quite a few of her perspectives. I think she might not be um, a trans supporter, for example. I also don't think she's right with about her main criticism of Marx. She says that Marx uh, said that feudalism inevitably had to lead to capitalism and there was nothing that could be done about it. It just, we have to go through these stages and then can come socialism. I don't think he actually did say that. I think he, ex he focused on explaining how feudalism led to capitalism and how it can only be the working class that can overthrow capitalism and establish socialism and then communism. But des despite those, those criticisms, her, her book's been a real eye opener for me, a real, lots of wow, wow moments. She explains, for example, that the um, development from feudalism into capitalism uh, was not inevitable. There were very strong egalitarian movements reflected, for example, in, in the peasant rebellions of, of 1381 and beyond. Uh, and that, you know, as long as people are being oppressed, they will resist and they will rise up. And she goes through a lot of the movements that sprung up, you know, in between 1300 and 1600, which is very inspiring, especially in today's funny period where we're under attack after attack. And it, it looks like, you know, nothing is being done, but I think actually something will happen soon, will have to happen soon. So people rose up and rebelled against feudalism. They rebelled against bonded labor. They rebelled against serfdom. Uh, and they fought against the changes that were brought in during that torturous transition to, to capitalism. It was really interesting, for example, when she describes um, how after the plague had killed millions of people, it actually led to what's called the golden age of the proletariat. Uh, Marx called it that when people simply refused to work for as long as before and for as little money as before. They, the bosses could do nothing about it because there were so few people left and people took matters into their own hand. 
They uh, fought to stop the setting up of enclosures, which is where the, the levelers got their name from, which was hedge, hedges and fences um, that the capitalist, the rising capitalist class put around the commons, which had provided for hundreds of years sort of everything for, for the peasant. The peasants could just go into the, the forest, into the, the rivers, uh, the lakes, and, and took what they needed. It was free, common, common land belonged to everybody. And in this process, people just didn't uh, didn't just rebel. They actually got together to fight for positive alternatives, for example, for the sharing of the wealth um, and against hierarchies and authoritarian rule. And in that uh, process, they established a more egalitarian relationship between each other and between men and women. And a really fascinating uh, uh, history is, is of the heretics. And I'd urge comrades to look that up. There's like a liberation theolo theology, if you haven't heard about it before. They built alternative utopian socialistic uh, communities, some of which lasted for over 300 years. And they were very popular amongst sort of lower classes. They basically took themselves out of the feudalism, the feudal society, and lived their own life by, you know, self-sufficiently with women and men both in charge, persecuted by the church and the feudal lords, of course, because they didn't pay taxes, etc., with almost no control over them. And there were women were very central in these um, uh, in the peasant community as well, but also in these sort of um, alternative communities. They worked together. You know, it wasn't like today everybody's got their own house and the, you know if they wish probably, but it was all very collective. It was child rearing, harvesting, tending to animals, spinning, washing. They were all done together, very much in solidarity, collectively with each other. Um, and, you know, they became strong, of course, with that kind of solidarity and those kind of living and working together had to be broken down if capitalism was to succeed. Capital needed, capitalism needs wage laborers, not self-sufficient, independent artisans and small peasants. You need to be, you know, you shouldn't have land uh, if you're a wage laborer. You need to be independent of the land, uh, independent from your own uh, productive uh, methods basically. So the witch hunt were an integral part of that forced transition from feudalism to capitalism, which saw the crushing of, of all sorts of egalitarian movements and the central role of, of women within it. And I, I thought that was extremely, extremely interesting. She, that basically goes a long way of explaining how women's oppression was artificially created and carried on into today's society. And it was as integral to setting up capitalism as the slave trade. And as a, doing away with the with the commons, which, as I said, was a very socialistic way of of living with the land and you know together with it, with nature, um, so nothing irrational about it. Um, and this this brings me to the Labour Party and this witch, Jackie Walker, um, my favourite witch. It's called Pilgrim State, and I've known her. I've known Jackie since she was made a. Uh, vice chair of momentum uh, before you know before she got demoted by Lanzmann because she said something anti-semitic apparently i don't think she did um we started working together in labor against the witch hunt for many years and only last year i learned she's written a book uh, it's a biography of her mother dorothy which is also sort of the uh, autobiography of her own childhood and you know when you when you find out your friend's written something you think on a thing you you think usually oh god okay i'll read it i'll, I'll not tell them about it because it's probably going to be not great um it's what actually that's kind of what i <laughs> expected because you you know uh, you, you know somebody well and you, you know is she going to be a really good author and oh my god jackie walker is a fantastic author this book is absolutely stunning it's poetic, it's sad, it's hilarious, and it's very, very moving. She's um, created a kind of collage, a montage of her mother's life, who died of an asthma attack um, in front of Jackie and her other children when Jackie was only 11. And belong until this day, clearly remains a huge influence uh, on Jackie. Remember the, the play, The Lynching, was told from Dorothy's point of view, and, and Dorothy also chaired the Not the Ford Inquiry at last year's Labour Party conference. So the novel is made up of letters, court records, and memories of Jackie and other family members, and uh, also the official notes of the uh, psychiatric hospital Pilgrim Centre, which is where the title comes from, um, in New York, where her mother was committed by her then-husband, uh, who basically tried to get rid of her. So she... 
Jackie paints a really beautiful portrait of a, of a woman who struggled all her life against poverty, tried to better herself, make a better life for her children, but also suffered from depression, um, especially after her oldest daughter, Pearl, was taken away into foster care, as are temporarily Jackie and her brothers, uh, Teddy and Roy. But Dorothy never gave up on her children, and she continued to fight uh, as part of the civil rights movement in the, in the U.S., and for that, she was deported to Jamaica, where she was born, had to leave her children uh, for many months with relatives while she was looking for work. And when Jackie was four in 1959, they all moved to London, hoping for a, a better life. But comrades know what London was like then and can imagine probably for a single black woman and her three kids. So there's a lot of racism she got uh, at school, etc. And there's really a lot of really super beautiful scenes she's really good at setting scenes that draw you in really effortlessly and poetically she got a lot of money for this book actually and a lot of prizes and i'm not surprised um so she describes for example that how they drug up her mom just before her hearing in that psychiatric hospital and and all dorothy wants to do is desperately find a comb to make herself look a bit presentable um, there's an earthquake in jamaica and it reminds jackie of a ride on an elephant and or when Jackie and this is this is a this is a horrible scene, but Jackie wakes up, Dorothy is not not there. Jackie freaks out and makes her brother Teddy call the police because they think something might have happened to her, and instead they get taken to a children's home. And you know, as you can imagine, Jackie feels guilty about this for a long, long time. Probably still does. It's extraordinarily moving scenes. Just uh, if I have a one minute to read out a, a tiny short paragraph which is actually when when jackie discovers she's black when she's about five she's she's painted a picture for her daughter uh, for her mother uh jackie dorothy says uh what do you think of the colors you've used don't you like the yellow oh yes it's very pretty the brown with the yellow but what about the face the color of the face but jackie was sure the face was exactly the way it should be just like everybody else had painted except hers she knew she knew what's the best are the cheeks too red jackie asked Give me your arm. Dorothy placed the child's hand against the face of the picture. What color is the face you painted? It's pink. What color is your skin? What color? Jackie looked again. She was a color. That's what we're called colored, sweetheart. Our, our skins are made up of every shade of brown you can think of. Some so light you can barely see it. Others so black they almost look like as their skin is blue. Color seemed simple when mummy talked about it like that, but even... Then, then even more questions came into Jackie's head, like how come they call English people white when really they're pink and even, yes, you'd seen it, sometimes even a bit blue. And why did white people say that she was half cast when she was so much darker than they were anyway? Um, you, you get the drift. That, and that, that reminded me of my own daughter who described to me when she was five, uh, her new best friend, what she looks like. Uh, she's got her hair is that long, her clothes, da, 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 her laughter didn't mention one that once that that child was actually black didn't occur to here to her it really showed me that um sort of racism is such an unnatural and an artificial thing something that children have to learn be taught just like you know that mm. impression of women so these two books are really both sort of wow books that will keep you up all night when you're reading it and for jackie's books you're going to need some tissues as well <laughs>